everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Tales from the Castle podcast. And in this podcast, we are going to be talking about all different subjects regarding and related to Scottish history. And the only thing basically that is going to tie them together is at the end, we are going to tie each one back to our Dundonald Castle to explain to you why exactly each topic is so important to us. My name is Blythe, and I am the education officer with the Friends of Dundonald Castle. And in addition to that, I am a PhD student, and I work on motivations behind fortification in 14th century Northumberland in the departments of medieval history and archaeology at the University of Glasgow. I am originally from Connecticut, but I moved over here about five years ago and have been studying and working here since then. And I'm now going to pass you over to my lovely co-host, Gwen. Hello there, everybody, and uh, welcome to our podcast. Now, I uh, work at St. John Castle. I uh, work alongside Blythe uh, very often in the education programme where we take uh, parties of mostly of school children and teach them about medieval life, quite often in costume. And my background is, generally speaking, I'm a graphic designer. My first job, I worked in a theatre company, and strangely, I had to wear a medieval costume for about six months. We were doing a touring show show of the Hyde Piper of Hamelin. My second job, I worked at the Dick Institute and the Dean Castle in Kilmarnock and I started off as a curator's assistant and my job was to draw everything for cataloguing and once I finished all that they sent me to the castle and my job was to to sit upstairs in the Great Hall and embroider the great big banners of all the families that who had lived in the castle in Ayrshire. So it's strange how I found myself back in a castle again. In between that I was working with tourist boards in Ayrshire and all also, the, I was the tourist board manager in the Isle of Skye in Portree for about five years. And I'd also worked on the Isle of Rassi. And uh, yes, yeah, so but my job at the castle has been absolutely brilliant. And at the moment, we're working on a lot of stuff online because obviously the castle's been closed just now because of COVID. And we're doing a lot of online content. So be able to use a lot of my writing skills and also my graphic design, and my illustration skills. But we'll come back to that a wee bit later. So hope you enjoy the show. Today, we are going to be talking about a very, very important guy in fact as far as we're concerned the important guy Robert II and to help us we have a very special guest who hopefully you'll become very familiar with in this podcast his name is David Taylor he is a castle tour guide and so I will pass you over to Dave if you want to introduce yourself you want my background pre-castle or just what I do in the castle and it's up to you not that I don't find you fascinating but I don't want to spend the half an hour episode listening about like Cyprus but oh, this is a crap first date isn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but... this, is, this is lockdown dating for you uh, yeah <laughs> better to give it a mess i think but i think people would appreciate a little bit of background right okay yeah thanks for having me on um the very first episode as well i feel quite honored actually so i i started working here in 2015 but my background is royal air force air traffic controller and i did that for uh, over 30 years so i've served all over the uk uh, a lot of time in germany a bit of time in sardinia uh, three years in cyprus and some time down the falklands and myself and my wife we were originally posted up here as part of my air force career in 2003 and it was supposed to be just for a couple of years uh, and we've been here ever since what i do now basically is i, I try and bring the place to life for people so um you know i try and use my words their imagination and i I try and put them in the moment and of course as you both know prior to lockdown we had a a really busy school program and um, we all had different characters that that we played so i'm I'm probably better known to all the school kids in asia and bits of glasgow as one of my alter egos either eric bloodax the you know the viking or uh, when we do the wars of independence i have to be the prisoner because i'm english and that's the way it is apparently so um, actually i I quite like being a prisoner (laughs) And um, yeah, oh, well, Stony Bean once, wasn't I? The uh, infamous. That's the best one. Yeah, the infamous uh, cannibal. Yeah, that's probably what I might put on my CV, basically. Tour guide, prison, and cannibal. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's me in three words. <laughs> Right. So we're going to circle back to Robert II. Who is he? Today, mostly what we're going to be talking about is what our perception of Robert II is and how we get that perception and challenging that perception a little bit and the research that we've done. But before we get there, I want to tell you just a little bit about Robert II in the first place, just in case you don't know who he is. Robert II is the first ever of the Stuart monarchs. So he was born in 1316. His mother was Marjorie Bruce, daughter to Robert the Bruce. 
and Marjorie's husband was Walter, the sixth high steward of Scotland, who at the time owned the hill at Dundonald, although we don't think there was a castle there at that time. So he's born in 1316, and he's grandson to King Robert the Bruce, who at the time doesn't have any sons. But a few years later in 1324, his uncle David II is born and he's son of Robert the Bruce. So of course, when Robert the Bruce dies in 1329, David II becomes king. David II is king until 1371, when he dies rather unexpectedly at the age of 46. So in 1371, the throne passes from David II to his nephew, R. Robert Stuart, who was, what, 55 at the time? And probably never expected to become king in his life. And he's pretty important because he's the guy that built our castle. Not only that, but he is, as I say, the first of the Stuart monarchs. And the Stuarts go on to rule Scotland for hundreds of years until 1603, when James the Sixth of Scotland and First of England goes on to rule both England and Scotland for another just about 100 years. So we'll kick this off then with this impression that we have of Robert II as a baddie old man. Well, I would like to come in uh, just first of all, because uh, part of the project that I was working on recently, uh, we were creating video content. Uh, Blythe has put together video content for our YouTube channel. And um, we wanted to create characters. We wanted to think, what do these people actually look like? Because there isn't any records of them. So therefore, we, obviously, we, I started with Robert II, as you do. I started with him and realised that we have no representations of him apart from two, which we actually have at the castle. One of them is his coins. Also in the Great Hall, in the Lake Hall at the bottom, we've got two heads that have been carved and five size heads put onto the wall quite high up on one of the, the, the windows. Now, one of them's a man and one's a woman, so it's always been assumed that one is Robert and one of his, one's his wife, Euphemia. Then I've been working on what he might have looked like and I looked up and found out there is actually a representation of him uh, you know, in modern day terms, or if you want to call the 18th century modern day, but, but for him that is, and it was it was a it was a piece of uh, kind of etching on paper that was done, that is based in it's in the the Scottish Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh. Now I'm going to bring a comment in so that I know that Dave will laugh when I say this, but David actually suggested that when we looked at the you're called Stuart, obviously Robert Stuart. When we looked at the racing driver, Jackie Stuart, right? He has a very obvious nose and nostrils, which which all of these characters have. Even the one that's the, the head, you can see an outline of where the nostrils would be. But this particular um drawing that, that that's in the National Portrait Gallery has got these exact nostrils. So that was the first thing I drew, Dave, was those nostrils when I was doing them, doing the picture of them, you know, to get the nose correct. And then I built it from there. But in my opinion, he is a, 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 a well, okay, well, let's go to another representation of what I think he might have looked like. And that was in uh, John Preble's book, The Lion in the North, which is his personal opinion of a thousand years, I think, of Scottish history. He says that Robert was a, a tall and handsome man with bloodshot eyes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so again, a wee bit sort of... Um, degrading and then I thought well I wonder if you have that many children you're gonna have bloodshot eyes so perhaps we want to bounce the evening on to why he had bloodshot eyes I think we might find <laughs> that at the end of this podcast we'll, we'll probably know why he had bloodshot eyes but basically I thought well I, so I focus on the tall and hand I, I imagine quite thin and tall and also we're looking at his genealogy he's got like he's got to, he's got to Celt he's got a lot of Celtic roots he's got he's got his um one of his grandmothers is I is is from Wales. Her father was the was the, basically the king of Wales, and his other grandmother, uh, his father, was basically a king of uh, Connaught in Ireland, and the high high king and Rhee of of Connaught, and I think in Ulster. So so he's got she's got a lot of he's got a lot of um, Celtic roots. So I just imagined him to be fairly. I thought he probably would have blue eyes. He probably was quite thin, and I do think he'd a very shrewd face. I think he's a very clever man. And so that was my so my representation is in. What's the name of the film again, Blythe? That he's well, in? it is uh, the relationship between Robert II and David II. That'll be your first chance to see uh, Gwen's representation of Robert II. Mm -hmm. But we can also put that in the show notes. All of these portraits you're talking about, we can put in the show notes. So anybody that's interested can have a look at them. Right? Okay, so, yeah. I mean, I was interested, Gwen, that you said you like to concentrate on the tall and handsome bit. That, that, that was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, there is a, an illustration of Robert um, in the Seaton Armorial as, as well, which, like you say, that's got 
the long face it's got the the long nose with the sort of horsey nostrils you know and um <laughs> slightly sort of hooded eyes and that's something if you look through all the Stuart kings they all seem to have them all the Jameses have them Charles I and Charles II but that's probably accentuated by that little triangular goatee that they have anyway but um they all seem to have that same nostril and like I said I was I just happened to just by chance look at see a see a picture of Jackie Stewart and I thought that's exactly the same bloke and I put the two pictures side by side and you could you could swap one for the other and they are identical I'm maybe putting two and two together and making 1371 but I reckon that Jackie Stewart's got the same you know the same genes you know and, I think it's um, funny that that you two go for handsome when Frostart is the what is sort of our main admittedly negative impression of Robert the second and he's the one that says Robert the second is ugly among hundreds of other horrible things that he says mm. about him yeah I mean you've got one of the chroniclers Forden said he's a he's a comely youth tall robust modest likable with an innate sweetness um Abbot Bauer he's impressive humble mild affable cheerful and honorable so you know and these he's, are the Scottish he, chronicles, so I think there's yeah. you almost see a difference there between how he's yeah. portrayed by yeah. sort of loyal Scots versus English or English leaning yeah. chronicles. It's, it's obviously a bit of propaganda, but I, I, I think the impression you get is that he's a he's a he's a good looking lad. I think he's physically fit. He enjoys hunting, you know, and um, this idea that you know where he's old 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 bleary eye which is made with a bloodshot eye thing i don't know see that's 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 an insult again you know and um you probably want to touch on this in a bit but this thing where he's um he's weak in body and mind i think we'll we'll disprove both of those yeah. as, as we go through the podcast actually because they're both wrong so i think it's frost out that gives us this impression that he is kind of this baddie old man king that doesn't have any control over his kingdom uh and i wonder in the research that you guys have done what your thoughts are on that you know that's all very well for them to be saying that but when he took the throne well when it was unexpected but also he david's throne was really weak it was a very very weak throne he was in prison for a long long period robert was running the country all that time regardless of you know the relationship between them that's what he was doing and he he strengthened scotland and he, he turned it around in terms of him um, it's i suppose what would you say it's monetary value or, or, it's, or it's a lack of wars i don't know whether one comes he's, the other. he's he very much he's literally. very much running he's very much running it to his own aims you know he's he's he's, he's building this power base up and he's spreading this spider web of, of Stuart influences i think of 11 uh, sorry 15 oldens by the time he's he's dead 11 of them are, are are controlled by the Stuarts. so you know he's, he's he's this thing like where he's weak in mind well he's you know he's more like a snooker player he's thinking two or three moves ahead all the all, all the time he's not a war leader I, you know he's 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 not really like his granddad david is much more into the chivalry stuff robert's not a war leader i think he's more of a a wheeler and dealer he'll he'll cut a deal with you rather than fight you i think he i think he's using caterans up in the the, the highlands as 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 well these bands of armed troops so he's not averse to giving you good kicking but you know he'll he'll have he'll have a proxy to do it rather than rather than do it himself but you know he'll, <laughs> it, when he needs to but he'd much rather under. he'd much rather sell you one of his kids i think to be honest and fight you oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, but do you know that does that not tell you right that he um, I don't think he's afraid at all I think he's always armed well I mean he came to the throne armed with 21 of them right at least potentially there was more because even his illegitimate children got really good positions in society yeah. if you look at that they were given variously you know he, he acknowledged them I mean okay I, I like to always to mention the fact that he gave three of his children the name Walter so he named three of them <laughs> after his father so he obviously must have liked mm -hmm. his father quite a lot uh, but also Walter, to be fair, was the, was the first of the high stewards in the dynasty that, that was based in Dundonald. So I guess, you know, it was a kind of nod towards that. For one of his great-grandfather, all three of them were, were given a, a recognition in one of his sons. And let's be honest, they were highly educated children, you know, with a lot of shrewd skills to bring to it. Mm. And they were they were they were using the the fact that they were also they were mixing this these two the house of Stuart with the house of Bruce, so they had quite a lot of clout from a lot of different parts of Scotland. 
So talking so about this, this kind of tactic that Robert has mm-hmm. of installing his kids, we see this um, practice of Robert kind of growing his own territory. It starts in 1334, because that's the first time that David II gets sent away. Uh, Robert Stewart is 18 years old, yeah. and David, who was only 10 at the time, ends up having to flee <laughs> France because Edward III and Edward Bailey all have joined forces, and they're mm-hmm. invading Scotland, right? And he's in France for seven years and for what between 1334 and 1335 and then 1338 to 1341 again robert story is guardian of scotland oh. and then david comes back or he's back in scotland oh. from 1341 to 1346 because in 1346 he gets captured at the battle of neville's cross and then he's in essentially prison but probably a pretty cushy prison down in England between 1346 and 1357 and so for all of that time again Robert is guardian and so for the period that David is king Robert's guardian of Scotland without David in the country for 15 years. Yeah and and of course while David's in England most of that Robert is the sole guardian because um, the other guy John Randolph is killed at the same yep. battle, yeah. Um, and just just going back a little bit, it's about him not being, I was saying about him not being a, considered a, a war leader, and that the fact that he left the battlefield during Battle of of, of Neville's Cross. Now, there's there's two ways of looking at this, and I can be swung either way to things. There's a whiff of cowardship, isn't there, really, because he leaves his king to get captured. And you could say where, you know, he turned tail and ran. You know, uh, it depends which report you read, whether he actually he actually um, made contact with English or or not. Or, you know, was was he was he holding back until he saw what was what, what was going on? Is he is he cowardly or is he just being prudent because the king's captured? I'm now the heir to the throne. If I get myself killed and captured, how are we going to benefit from that? You know, it's much better if I just get out of here and then we can, you know, we can we can re- regroup, you know. So you've kind of hit the nail on the head there with I think where this bad press starts for Robert Stewart, mm. isn't it? It's after he leaves, or after he survives, I should say, the Battle of Neville's Cross in 1346, mm. because there is this difference of opinion, and you see it even then in contemporary writings where Mm. with half half the crowd going towards he's a coward he ran to save Mm. his own skin and the other half going towards exactly as you said he's so brave he did this meticulously to be able to save scotland because he recognizes now david's Mm. been captured as you say john randolph the other guardian the other man that had had been appointed guardian of scotland was killed at neville's cross if i die here or am captured what happens to scotland and you could be uncharitable there and, and 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 say he's thinking right i'm in here now because you know David David's away you know the thing about refuting he was cowardly I would refute it because it, he was 30 years of age at that point by my calculations right which is really young and maybe um, we don't know who he was given because these are two really young men like David would only be 20 at that battle and you know he was 30 so who was the guys that were giving them instructions who were the the big kind of you know major players really who were making these decisions for war maneuvers it wouldn't have been them at that age I wouldn't have thought unless they were extremely canny but I suspect that they were taking advice from somebody and one of them would have said right you need to go now you've taken the king you need yeah. to go I mean Robert, Robert's minute. 30 <laughs> Robert's 30 isn't he so um, yeah, he's 30, you know, He's a grown, but he's a grown man. He, he's, he's, it's not like he was at Halliden Hill. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he's making his own, his own decisions. David, you're quite right. I mean, he's a lot younger. He's, he is the king. Maybe he's just pulling rank on people. But you know, I mean, that's, a, that's a very good point to make, isn't it? We don't know. I think he was told to go. I think you better go now. I don't believe. I know. Maybe I'm just being a big softy because I don't want to think of him being. We that. love him. It's because we love him, and we, but we don't also think it doesn't fit into the rest of his life. That actual story, to me, doesn't really fit into his behaviours in, uh, later on in his life. It's as if he just had a mad turn when he was 30. No, I believe, I believe he was instructed. I know we're going to, I'll go a wee bit into the future, just as an example. One of his descendants, which I can I'll plan and work out how far down the line it is, it's you know, six or seven generations, was Charles Edward Stewart, right? He was on his, he was on even very determined, he was a young man, he was actually about 26 or something in the, the 1745 rebellion. Mm. 
he led. He led that rebellion, but he was given instruction by generals and various old warlords, and they made decisions that were wrong. We know now they were extremely wrong decisions, and he went along with them. So I do believe that even regarding the fact that at 30, that might have seemed quite old at that period, I still don't think so. I mean, there was older men who were he was surrounded by, and he had the, he had the faithful loyalty of... The bad press really continues there, doesn't it? Because it's in... 1351 that David manages a deal for himself and the English let him come up to Scotland to attempt to get Parliament to the Scottish Parliament to agree to this deal the start of 1352. Basically the agreement was that he would have to name as his heir apparent a son of Edward III who would not inherit the English throne. And John of Gaunt was the chosen recipient and surprisingly you know you would think that he would get up to Scotland and this would be a hands down no way at that point uh, Robert Stewart manages to get that deal scrapped but only kind of by a narrow margin so there is there is this perception there that he is trying to keep David in prison for his own ends but on the flip side you can look at it as he's trying to protect Scotland and keep it out of English hands at all costs and that's why David stays in English prison. So I think this all works out for Robert though, doesn't it? Because while David is in England for so long, he spends that time making matches for his children yeah. and obtaining territory yeah. in Scotland. So that by the mm-hmm. time David comes back in 1357, he's created this massive power base for himself. I mean, so large that it's at least into the 1360s before we see David really try and strike back at him at all. Uh, and I think that's really the start of this massive friction between them, isn't it? Is this, I'm sure David's probably thinking, come on, man, stop dragging your feet. And also by the time he does finally get back, he realizes that what, what Robert's been doing this whole time is expanding his own power and his own territories. I wonder, it just occurred to me, maybe Robert but sitting there hurriedly getting back because while he's down in England, he can't produce an heir either. So, you know, mm-hmm. whereas Robert's produced them almost, almost on a weekly basis, you know. It, <laughs> it things, so, you know. And that's one of the ones we know about. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to, to dismiss the guy, but I do feel as if, right, okay, let's go back to the beginning when we were talking about these particular chroniclers who have maybe made well the, the red rimmed guy so the red eyed guy the you know the, the kind of whatever the negativity they put around them right i feel as if what's happened is they have they've they've latched onto the name right they've latched onto david's name david bruce david bruce was from robert the bruce robert the bruce is our most illustrious king that we've ever had in scotland and so therefore they've wanted to believe in him more than they've wanted to believe in robert stewart i feel as if these chroniclers had an awful tendency to to report the dark stuff that happened in the extreme skullduggery it's a, it's a tabloid oh. mag isn't it you know <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not going to sell if you say, you know, Meghan Markle looks beautiful today. No one's going to buy it. <laughs> Meghan Markle's got bloodshot eyes. And who? Yeah. <laughs> and who? Yeah, and it goes back to who oh, yeah. pays for it, doesn't it? Who paid for yeah. Ross, Ross Hunt's Chronicle? Honestly, exactly what know, exactly what I was going to say. You know, who? You know, the guy who pays the piper calls the tune. We're going back to the poem, the Bruce. Exactly the same thing. You know, if it, if it was Robert, and you know, that's what I seem to read mostly that pray Robert Bruce because. Robert wants that link with him too. You know, I mean, it's a very short dynasty, but what a hell of a dynasty, you know. Back to the beginning. (laughs) So, well, where we were was we... What are we doing next? We talked about Robert sort of building a power base while David was away. So I guess where I was going to go next is... uh, So it's 1357, and David II returns from his captivity in England to find that Robert's made this massive power base for himself. And then what? He starts chipping away Robert's holdings, and he's actually quite brutal in in some cases. Because where was Robert cuts deals to say, "I'll let you marry my daughter, or my son will marry your 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 daughter." David, on some occasions, is is going right. You, your daughter, is marrying his son. Yeah, you know, and I'm going to write an entail that if they die without kids, it's coming back to the crown. You know. And he does that with um, Robert Stewart's oldest son, John, doesn't he? So in 1367, David II essentially forces Robert Stewart's oldest son, John, to marry his wife's niece, Annabel Drummond, because he's trying to to establish a Drummond dynasty. Because at that point, of course, Robert is decently older than David. And so they don't see Robert ever being king. They think the first Stewart king, if there is one, is going to be John. And he's married to a Drummond. He forces him into it, it kind of backfires, because of course, two years later, 
he divorces Margaret Drummond. He's pretty brutal in the 1360s in the way that he detracts from Stuart power, isn't he? So do you think he was a wee bit of a, a bit of a tyrant then, really? Oh just, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 I mean he he would probably say I had to be brutal because the Stuarts had taken so much of the land. And I mean, he's already got his, his West Coast holdings. And, you know, like, like we said earlier, he's mate with the Lords, Lords of the Isles. He's, he's got so all the highlands really around Perth and, and, and North. So he's got massive amounts of country, you know. He's, and I think by then Robert's also <clears throat> married to uh, Euphemia Ross. So he's got Murray shirt as well. Even more, even more. So he's yep. John Randolph's wife. That's right, yeah, so yeah. She oh, got yeah. a good portion of what was his. And then Robert marries her and gets that portion for himself, mm-hmm. or at least as part of you know his family's allotment. And he's also got the holdings in Ayrshire that he got as the dowry from his first wife, Elizabeth Muir, who yep. was from Royal yep. Allen, who was just along the road from uh, where we are in Dundonald, as we were explaining earlier, that was a marriage that was and uh, that was disputed, which meant that her their ten children were not necessarily seen as legitimate heirs to the throne. And that's when he went, did he not did he not go to Avignon to meet the Pope to get that? Yes, um, he did. Yeah, that was yeah, where the Pope was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And is that the only record that we have of him leaving the country then? Leaving Scotland. Oh, uh I don't Good think point, actually. Record. I don't think I think he was a bit a bit of a, a, a we were but saying that maybe potentially he was a, a very strong kind of person who liked to stay at home in Scotland and you know he liked his he liked his keeps. He obviously he's built in Donald Castle, he's got Rothsey Castle. And he's apparently... too busy producing kids to go abroad, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, well, and also we've got records of at least two mistresses. Now there's my, yeah. in, my, in my opinion that, that it's very likely that, that they would have been around at the same in the royal household alongside his wife Euphemia and um, possibly Elizabeth Muir had to put up, put up with that as well but it doesn't seem there's, there's one important. called there's one that you pro I'm sure you know that's Mariotta de Cardinet it's pronounced yeah. different ways different spellings but I think he's got a shucked up over somewhere on the east coast if I'm rightly but I can't I can't place where it is it's men you know maybe Maybe he's a Lothario or maybe he's just a hopeless romantic. That's up for debate. Hey, he's tall, really, well, yeah. tall and handsome. If he's tall and handsome, but he's only he's only he's only um downside was they had blobby bloodshot eyes, according <laughs> to the to the historians. I've written about him. I mean, at 55, that's not, that's not too bad if that's all that was wrong with them. You know, he's, probably been, he's, he's probably been drinking dodgy vodka like Blythe, you know, <laughs> till the morning. <laughs> Okay, just to, just to say this, that he did not, he didn't ignore the children who were from illegitimacy, and, and we've all seen Game of Thrones, and you know that they did. The other people did, so it made, it made Robert look like a good guy, but he didn't actually, um, he did not like that, that tells you a bit more about him, doesn't it? And if he's an old guy at this point, he's still looking after them all. And I think that says a lot, I really do. I think what we can honestly take from that is that he was a family man. Yeah. He cared about. He actually genuinely yeah. cared about his children and his family, mm. and that's that's the feeling I, I get from him. Mm. I don't think he was a, a guy who was. I mean, maybe he didn't care very much about what his wife thought, but <laughs> when he was <laughs> to five to stay his with wives. her. But, yeah. But how how do we know that she didn't have a lover? We don't know that. Yeah, I she mean, didn't. it's interesting to think that you know they talk about his first wife as being his as them having lived in a secular marriage and it does make you wonder what is a secular marriage in 1350 it's a really good question is it like hand fasting you know but that's supposedly only good for you know a certain amount of time and hand fasting is is a is a guy it's actually a really really ancient tradition it's right back to the gales and possibly beyond that what it is is you meet someone you want to be with and you you say yeah i want to be with you we'll try it out for a period of time like as by says it could be a year usually it was a year and there were some cultures it was seven years and if you decided you didn't um, want to be together you would just break up there was no such sort a of thing as divorce but the hand fasting involved with putting, you know, tying the ribs tying oh them. yeah i've heard of that i didn't know that was what it was called yeah, I really didn't know. yeah. it was a really big yeah. deal it was seen as a it was actually seen as a a really formal commitment mm. unfortunately when you know if they were trying to kind of curry favor say with with europe and getting in with the pope which they seem to be that's the start of the declaration of growth was them trying to get back in with the pope and it's likely that Robert would have maybe if his marriage with they were people were putting rumours out saying his children weren't legitimate. 
And he didn't mean, I can imagine him being actually quite angry about that. And it's actually an angry man boarding a galley and to head off to France and well, demand technically, technically they were right because he wasn't married to this woman. Well, he was. Yeah. If as, far as, the church, as far as the church was exactly. concerned, he wasn't yeah. married to her. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, but as far as traditions here were, he was. Mm. It's just that they were, because they were trying to, they were trying to bring everything in line with Europe. Our favourite guy, David II, he kicks the bucket in 1371. And just a bit, a brief bit about what happens then. At that point, after David II dies, Robert, of course, is heir to the throne because David II doesn't have any children. But his path to the throne isn't perhaps as easy as you might think it would be. So before, between the 22nd of February, 1371, which is when David II dies, and the 26th of March, 1371, which is when Robert II is crowned, you have this short period where William, the first Earl of Douglas, rocks up at Linlithgow with supposedly a group of armed men to form this Congress, either to claim the throne for himself through this really tenuous claim through his brother-in-law that links him back to the commons and the Balliols, or to claim the throne for the English, Edward III and John of Gaunt, which is something that we know that David had tried for multiple times in his life. And this could be a threat in a few different ways. Even if William is only claiming for himself, but especially if he's claiming for the English, there's a possibility that the English will come to his aid. And so that is a massive threat. And lucky for Robert, the English don't show up. And William William's plans are kind of scuppered when John and George Dunbar, who are the brothers of David II's mistress, and Robert Erskine, who was guardian of David II's mistress at the time of David II's death. These are all people that we thought would be enemies of Robert Stuart, but they show up at this Congress at Linlithgow and declare for Robert Stuart's claim. And so that kind of ends William's hopes, or dashes William's hopes, of being able to stop Robert from becoming king. So there is this show that, you know, that David II had spent the last several years of his reign trying to take away from the Stuarts. And it shows after he dies, because there is a fight, a pushback, even if it is a bit of a weak pushback against Robert becoming king after David's death. But lucky for us, he does become king. And he goes on, I guess we'll talk about, can we talk about him as king? We finally got to this point where we can talk about his sort of policies and his his tendency towards peace and what people thought about him as as a king. He starts, he kicks off his reign by trying to keep peace with England kind of quickly thereafter. He, he does cede a lot of power to his son. So he's created this power base for himself with all these marriages. Mm. And it kind of almost comes around to bite him. So he has four, was it four sons originally with his first wife? Mm. And one of them, Walter, haha, mm. passes away before he becomes king. So he's really got three sons to reckon with. So the earl, the oldest one is John, the Earl of Carrick. The second one is Robert Stuart, who eventually becomes Duke of Albany. Oh. And the third one is Alexander Stuart, Earl of Buchan. And he's quite famous under his kind of nickname, the Wolf of Badenoch. Right. So he sets up uh, Alexander, the Earl of Buchan, the Wolf of Badenoch up in the north. And although in the early days he doesn't have um, perhaps the titles that he would like, he is given massive military powers in the north as a lieutenant of the crown. And so he has this kind of power over even the lords in the north to be able to restore law and order in the north of Scotland. So he becomes massively powerful. And then further south, you have the John Earl of Carrick, his oldest son, has most of his lands a bit further south. And then Robert, early on in Robert II's reign, he gives up the Earldom of Moray in order to obtain the earldom of Fife for his son, Robert Stuart. And also one of his daughters, Margaret Stuart, is married to John, Lord of the Isles. And again, shortly after Robert Stuart comes to the throne, he makes sure that it's his grandson that's going to obtain that. So massive, massive swathes of Scotland are now in Stuart hands. But his three surviving sons from his first marriage, John, Robert, and Alexander, all sort of become these really powerful figures who are vying for their own power. And I think this is where we get the image of him as, as this king who had no power and was puppet to his children who ran him up. And it's really these three. I mean, he has more, but it's really these three that are wreaking havoc throughout Scotland. His family owned probably, a rough guess, 75% of the country at, at, at at this point, you know, which, like I mentioned earlier, I think that's not bad going for a guy that's supposed to be weak in body and mind. You know, he hasn't 
he hasn't achieved this by accident. You know, what he has achieved, though, which is probably not a good thing, is the control of the country has been decentralized. Basically, you've got these fiefdoms, they've got these separate fiefdoms. As opposed to having one man in charge, you've got one man in charge of his patch, if you like. And Alexander becomes really, really unpopular in the north doesn't he because he's using and Dave you had mentioned this earlier he's using catarans so he's essentially hiring his own military off of his own uh properties and using them to enforce law and order in the north and that becomes really really unpopular though it's interesting to see um if you look at and and, uh Stephen Wardman's book talks about this as well if you look at what the perception was of Alexander in the north versus the south his totally nickname, different. the Wolf of Badenoch, mm. actually comes from um, a southern piece of writing. And in mm. the north, in Gaelic, the Gaelic speakers allegedly called him Alexander, the great son of the king. So it seems like culturally that these things that, you know, these tactics he was using um, to control the north were a lot more acceptable within the mm. north, within the Gaelic speaking mm. highlands. Mm than they were outside of the North. It was the people in the South that really had an issue with it. Very interesting. Yeah. You can send your son up if you like, but we'll just make him native. We'll make uh, him the same and we'll give him lots of, we'll give him like all our lassies, we'll get a wife, because did he not get a, a Highland wife as well when he went up there? But he, he wasn't necessarily um, behaving particularly bad. It might be that he was stopping the clans from, feuding we don't know we might have well been because it was horrific i mean some of those battles were just absolutely di- diabolical like the entire clan would be murdered in a church on a sunday morning and you know what i mean and, and actually to be fair the wolf of badenoch alexander right he is very well likely that he was accepted because if he wasn't he'd have been he'd have been feet, feet up in a ditch they wouldn't have let him stay them but he was allowed to marry into their clan and the genealogy must have suited them or they wouldn't have allowed it so I think Robert was probably, again, I'm going back to thinking he was really shrewd. And also think the fact that he could speak Gaelic would have helped to 100%, but also the fact that he was able to dis- make decisions based on, um, if we marry them, then that'll, that'll unite that, that certain. It's not just about land. I don't think it's just about land. I think it's about future future relations. I think he was trying to secure a future. And that's a, that's a very Gaelic tradition. So we don't know, maybe he was highly influenced I think I think that's 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 quite likely because like I said we know that he spoke Gaelic so he would understand I'm sure he wouldn't be just be able to speak it he would he would understand their ways and and the customs and what you were saying about Alexander almost being assimilated if if you like that may explain some extent the attitude of the the people from southern Scotland almost like a them and us sort of syndrome mm-hmm. he's he's not one of us he's 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 one of that lot up there in the northwest so what about uh, Robert's handling of the conflict on the border. I think he's keeping it very much at arm's length, and he he's using his lords down there, his magnates down there. I mean, he refers to them as oh, his overmighty lords, but I think that's a bit of propaganda. I think he's he's using it with a plausible deniability by he rather than saying that you yeah, haven't got a problem. It's not Scotland you got a problem with, mate. It's it's mm. this guy. It's this guy. You know, and yeah. you know if 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 you've got a problem. By all means, sort him out, but there's nothing to do with nothing to do with me. Yeah, I would buy that. I think he's um, he's he's being canny. It fits in with everything else that we know about him. He's being a little bit canny, and I think rather than pitting the whole country against it, he can he can just say no. It's not us. It's it's just that fellow down there. So if you've got a beef with anybody, you've got a beef with him. Either yeah. that, or he's totally out of control. You know, as, you know <laughs> other, mean, other people say. Robert's oldest son, John, the Earl of Carrick, who ends up becoming quite close to the second Earl of Douglas. And they sort of work together down in the borders to try and recapture a lot of this territory that the English have been occupying. And you're right, I think he looks at it as, well, it's not me. I'm not doing it. None of it comes directly from him. But then if you look at what's happening in the background, up until in 1380, 1381, he is rewarding these men that are serving John the Earl of Carrick you know it's hard to think that it's anything but a you know thank you for your service down there (laughs) thank you for what Mm. you're doing down there Mm. um while still being able to say this wasn't me Mm. but it seems to get out of his hands by 1383 1384 when John has made you know all these friends of people that Robert has perhaps alienated and has massive military powers on the border and wants 
different things. Um, so I think 1384 is really a breaking point, isn't it? Because that's when John of Gaunt invades up the east coast of Scotland, up to Edinburgh. And Robert II kind of goes, well, you guys attacked their castles in the English Pale. This was this was their retaliation for that. We wow. need to step back from this. Or seemingly that's what he said. And wow. John of Carrick and his allies are very, we need to attack England. We need to come back at this. And I think it's this division which splits them and ends in John the Earl of Carrick essentially taking you know, a guardianship of sorts and taking a lot of the military powers away from Robert II with the permission of the Scottish government at the time. Yeah, yeah. And of course, John the Earl of Carrick only lasts until 1388. He doesn't do very well in general, but then in 1388, his crony, the second Earl of Douglas, dies in the Otterburn campaign. And without that support, that's kind of the last straw. But instead of the power going back to Robert, Robert goes, well, you haven't been doing a good job. Ha ha, the government's going to get you. And they come and they give everything to Robert II's second son, yeah, Duke of Albany. Robert yeah. Stuart, the Duke of Albany, yeah. who yeah. strangely, you know, he's been kind of this background player this whole time. We haven't really been thinking about him, but he ends up almost being worse, you know? And he has a thing for... Alexander. He takes away so much of what was Alexander's. He doesn't like him at all. And he is guardian until after his father passes away. Yep. So here's where we have this view of Robert as this king that sat in the background and let his kids run amok. What do we think of that? <laughs> well, poor man. But I do believe it was on one of these tours that he was on that took led him to be overdoing it completely. And he, he ended up coming back to Dundonald and he died in Dundonald Castle because I think he'd gone on some tour that took him too far away at too, a terrible time of year. I, was, I used to live in Skye and I know fine that like the, even today, is some, you just wouldn't want to be hanging around there much at all. And I think it was this time of year that he was, he'd gone up in some big tour to try and, you know, negotiate, to chat, to kind of be make some kind of headway into becoming a, a part of the kingdom or even just to sort out what he's these it is, children are up to maybe it is right in 1390 it's kind of the statement of we think of robert as completely powerless from 1384 but he's not because as you say in 1390 he's still off you know he's in the highlands making this tour trying to you know we don't know exactly what it was that he was doing up there but basically conducting his own business and you're right it was that that caused him to be so ill and it drove him back to Dundonald and he passed away that year so he is still touring he's still you know up until 1390 at the time of his death he's still touring he's still yeah. conducting his business and even before uh john the earl of carrick's guardianship uh, in 1377 he stopped paying the english ransom payments for for david it, ii's ransom yeah was it was it two lots they paid it was something it wasn't it wasn't a great deal i had the impression that they'd been paying for a while because Somewhere around in 13, 1372, they had been paying ransom payments and there was a conflict over the receipts. Robert II sends people down to Berwick to meet the English representatives to make a ransom payment. The English representatives give a receipt to the Scottish representatives that say, you know, thank you for your payment, Robert, cousin to Edward III, King of England. Yeah. And the Scottish representative, representative say, no, excuse me, this is the King of Scotland. You need to change this receipt to say the King of Scotland. They go back and forth on this for like for months until finally they realize, right, Edward's not going to change this. He was never going to put the King of Scotland on these receipts. So we have to just take them as they are. So for me, that gives the illusion that they've been paying at least on and off for a little while. Yeah. I don't, when do they start? I don't think they start immediately after David's back. I think there's a period of grace before they start. So that would shift the whole thing to the right a little bit anyway but um hands up I, i'm not exactly no sure. i don't i don't know too I, much there's a number in my head but i, yeah. I could I, I could be confusing that with 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 something else but i know they don't pay them all anyway he does stop in 1377 yeah. you know that so he is that is robert taking some action no he's not yeah. gathering an army and invading england but also in 1377 how old is he you know he's in his what 60s at that point he's 61 years old in 1377 mm. you can't mm. expect him to be leading an army so to what extent is this a natural devolution of of power for him to say yeah. you know for john to be leading these military son to be leading some of these military excursions yeah. and for him to be 
you know, sitting in, in Edinburgh and Perth and directing them. And the fact that, you know, you mentioned that he, he's touring right up until the end of his life as well. Again, this gives the lie to this weak in body and weak in mind. He's not just wandering around aimlessly. He's going to these places for a, for a purpose. It's not like he's just sat at home in his dotage. They try and give the impression that he's, he's just sat in Dundonald with his feet up doing doing nothing with no idea what's happening what's happening around him. And that's just so un, unfair. And it, it's, it's lazy writing by the historians that write that, to be honest. And I think it's basically the, the fact that we, we came up with this sort of discussion that we were having a few weeks ago and it was about R2 versus D2, you know, Robert, Robert II versus um, David II, right? So we're going to Star Wars twist. I think that the, the, the people who have been like supporters of Bruce, you know, have overlooked, I mean, they often overlook a lot of his foibles as well. They act as if he's a kind of, you know, an, almost a demigod, I would say, in many ways, in, in people's descriptions of him. And he, he clearly wasn't, but, you know, even him, even he himself knew that. So what they've done is they've wanted to support David so much that they're actually intending to, to diss Robert, the grandson, because they want to make him seem less important. And it's just it's just futile, because actually, if you look at the, well, what we've been looking at more recently, you can get more access to more information now. So to be fair, we've probably uncovered more than a lot of these older writers would have would have been able to do or wanted to do. I think there's I think there's a certain stubbornness as well to the belief that you want to cling to that the Bruce was some kind of, as I say, a demigod. Mm. Yeah. They don't want to believe that any foibles that he would have wanted peace, but he was unable to achieve peace. And I think that from that point of view, Robert II was more like his grandfather because he didn't want to have war. If he had to, he would do it. He had a lot of wise counsel around him as well, I would think who helped him, but then he took a back seat. But like I would take a back seat if all if I had all those children and they're all men and they were older than he was when he when, when he was expected to be in battle himself. He was in the battle, first battle, I believe, when he was about 17. The Battle of Halden Hill, wasn't it? It was, was yeah, 17, yeah. And uh, if, if you, I think if you put yourself in, in, in Robert's shoes at that point, at Halden Hill, he's lost his father at 11. Right. He's living with his uncle who's at Halliden Hill and gets cut down in front of him. This is, this is a 70 year old boy. This, you know, this is probably forming the person that he, that he becomes, you know, he's, he, he's, he's lost the two men that are his, his figures, his, his role models, you know, one's died and one of them has, has been cut down in front of him. No, you you just... can understand why war f- actual fighting would be the final option for him and he would do everything he can to to avoid it if he if he if he can but, but, but don't you think it's then it strikes to me as something that's a, a creative option instead of just doing what everybody else is doing and being pushed into things he's making decisions okay he's giving away his daughters <laughs> not sure what the women of today would think about that but and i mean he's not unusual there everybody's doing that you know throughout throughout europe just the way it, it was we can't judge it well our 21st century sensibilities you know right and they, and, they, and they might have been happy to have had those alliances anyway because they mm. probably all have known each other because they had a lot of big social gatherings so they would have been mm. meeting up yeah, yeah. a lot of them were cousins and second cousins and things like <laughs> that <Yeah. laughs> they yeah. kind of knew each other so it's not a big surprise but I, I think my point really is just to say that I don't think that uh, we should Again, we perhaps shouldn't even be judging Robert by the, the by the fourteenth century standards. If he had the belief that you could negotiate, right, all war starts potentially round a table when things don't work out. It also ends round a table. You sit down and negotiate peace treaties, and you, 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 like, you know, obviously the wars that we in our families and great great grandparents and things like that memories. So Robert was able to sit down and say, well, do you know, let's just negotiate this and sort it out before it comes to war. Then to me, that's leagues ahead of so many people who were living in that society. And perhaps he was setting a precedent for that period in history. They they had enough of war. They were sick to death of these hideous situations of people lying, you know, cut down, monstrous situations for people. And he no longer, and perhaps, I mean, mean, the only, I mean, I'm just going to stick my neck out and say that perhaps he actually valued human life. And human fa- and family, and, and maybe I'm just an old romantic, but you know, it's always a thing. <laughs> Summing up, then, so I think that my overriding impression of Robert, the big thing that I kind of take away is that I think he valued his Gaelic speaking community, perhaps, or at least paid more attention to his Gaelic speaking community. And I think they uh, connected more with him than perhaps previous kings, not just not just because. 
of where his territories were, but also because, as you say, he spoke Gaelic. He was an avid hunter. That's not something we've spoken about a lot in this. Mm, no, that's true. Yeah. A, a massively hence, hence avid, um, yeah, a massively avid hunter. He spent loads of time at sort of unknown hunting lodges, and Dundonald itself, we think, is is a hunting lodge. So that's something that we think that perhaps the mm. um, the Gaelic speaking. Uh, portion of Scotland at the time would have perhaps respected more than the English speaking portion so he seems a lot more sort of um, Scottish or at least more mm-hmm. Gallic than certainly than David II who seemed to be a bit of an Anglophile. Yeah he's a bit of a divisive character uh, it, from what we what we've been saying but what people seem to forget is it's it's not so much him, it's what he started as that Stuart dynasty that went on for 343 years or, or you know, and then if you want to carry on further with, with Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, you know, it just carries on further and further. It started with him, but it, it, he has, he's got such an important place in British history, which I think is almost entirely ignored. I, I, can I, I'll just also add to that. I completely agree with you. I feel as if it's really, really sad that he was. I mean, to be honest, I'm going to give you this. I didn't actually know anything about him until I started working at St. Donald Castle. And obviously, that was it became an enormous interest. I wanted to know as much as I could in order to be able to, to tell people. I mean, the more, and the more I found out, the more I was like blown away. And you know, if you, if you know, if you ever come to Dindonal Castle and you're in the cafe, you might actually hear us all talking sometimes. And that's what, this is what we talk about. I mean, how exciting. Because <laughs> I mean, because right, okay, Dave comes in one day, you guess what I was reading? What, we all stop. I think we have learned about Robert. I believe that he, I think he's really pleased that we're doing this because how horrible to think that he's went to all that trouble. He's, he's been the yeah. father, but Robert II, he was the start, he was the merging of these two dynasties. He was the merging between the High Stewards and also the Bruce line and, and going yeah. right back all the way through to like Fergus the first 500 AD. And so we're looking at an enormous lineage and he has ignored and 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 unknown. I work. And I don't think Robert the Bruce would be happy to think that his grandson was ignored. You know. I think all of his work to secure places for his children is such a large part of the reason that his dynasty did survive. You know, we're saying he's overlooked and he is largely overlooked. And they this view of him as somebody that couldn't, you know, just let his children run amok and gave power over to his children. But mm. it's something that he clearly did at least, you know, before and in the start of his reign, really meticulously because he wanted to secure his dynasty's power. Mm. And it worked. Mm. I mean, when I first started working here, like you guys, I knew nothing about him. And then the first things I did learn was that basically he was he was he was useless because of ABC. I mean, when you actually start to think about it, that that just doesn't make sense, you know. And this is the point that we've been coming to to today. He's not this one-dimensional figure at all that you know people will give the the, the impression that he was. You know, he's not that at all. He's, he was a mighty important figure in British history. We have then painted a picture of a Robert II that we think is perhaps a bit more in touch with the Gallic community, at least to some extent, Mm -hmm. than his predecessors. Certainly more in control of the kingdom than he has been painted to be. He loved to hunt. Uh, He worked very meticulously to secure his dynasty. He didn't, as Gwen brought up, didn't seem to have left Scotland, which is something I'd never thought about before he left Scotland, seemingly the one time. Yeah. It's interesting. So he's a bit of a homebody. And think above all, a family man. He cares for his children, all of his children, not just his legitimate children. Up until sort of the end of his life, he cares for all of his children. And maybe he's he's either a bit of a romantic or a bit of a Lothario, but either one, he cares for the children that have come from at least a number of those mistresses. It's interesting to paint this picture of him because it feels like we've gotten to know him, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. for me, it's it's been great because I've learned stuff that I, 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 do, I didn't know. And it, it's really interesting to see how the three of us are actually coming at it from three different directions, but they're all sort of more or less joining at the at the same point. I'm no, just going to say, I think that simply because he is an, he's lesser known, I think that people leave from the castle because they get a fantastic tour mm-hmm. from Dave and other tour guides. And they realise that when they're, 
they've gone away, they've learned something they didn't know anything about. They've not been told to, you know, a, rep, a repeat of what they already did know, say, about a more well-known part of history. We're telling them something they probably didn't know about. And I would hope that a lot of them would go away and research it. So I think from the simple fact that the tour guides and, you know, the work that they do at the visitor centre, et cetera, I think it's helping to keep his memory alive. And I really hope it hope it does. And, and, I, and I think that's what really inspires me. I want to continue people to know about him. And I just hope we don't uncover something horrible about him. And I hate him. We'll be coming oh, on we do. next time and we'll be saying, hot, hateful Robert. Yeah. <laughs> what a hateful man with all these horrible children. And I think that is a really, really lovely summation of why Robert II matters to us so much. Not just us personally, of course, but us at oh. Dundonald Castle. He built our castle and he's the founder of the Stuart dynasty. And he is massively, massively important to us at the castle. Yeah. I think we've just put together a really decent picture as, as well as we can of who Robert yeah. II is. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking with us through our first ever episode of the Tales from the Castle podcast. Thank you so much, Gwen, and a special thanks to Dave for being our very first guest. If you're interested in more information on Robert II, please have a look on Dundonald Castle's website as we have a series of videos and blog posts which come out on a regular basis and can tell you a whole bunch more about him, including his relationship with David II, his coronation, and his ascension to the throne. So please keep an eye on our website. Of course, we'll put all of the sources that we used in the show notes as well as some of the portraits and pictures that we discussed. And if you had any questions, feel free to email me, Blythe, at education at dundonaldcastle.org.uk or you can reach out to Gwen at outreach at dundonaldcastle.org.uk. Again, thanks so much for bearing with us and hopefully we will be back with you soon. Good morning. Bye. Tales from the Castle podcast is recorded with and on behalf of the Friends of Dodonald Castle. However, all thoughts and opinions expressed in the podcast are our own. Our theme song comes from Blacksmith, composed by Alexander Nakarada, and can be accessed in full online on serpentsoundstudios.com. The Friends of Dodonald Castle are a registered charity, SCIO number SC03-1541. If you are interested in learning more about Dundonald Castle or supporting our charity, please see our website, dundonaldcastle.org.uk, or follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook at Dundonald Castle and Visitor Center, on Instagram at Dundonald underscore castle, on Twitter at Dundonald Castle, or on our YouTube channel, Dundonald Castle Education. Thank you so much.